Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the talk on your first week in Amazon EC2. Um, it's going to be an introductory talk on EC2, so to get started with, it'll be very helpful for me to get an idea to know how many of you have used Amazon EC2, maybe launched an instance or two. Show of hands. Okay, that's good. And then I'm assuming the rest of you have either not heard of Amazon EC2 or have never launched an instance. Um, so those of you that have launched an instance before, some of it may be a bit of a recap. Um, but I'm hoping that there's some pearls of wisdom or some little tidbits that you can take away um, from, from that, that part of the talk. So let's start off with some quotes. This one you've seen. It's interesting, this one's actually a year old, so it says a $2.7 billion business. And this morning we saw we had enough servers to run Amazon as a $5 billion business. The other one is one third of web surfers visit a site powered by Amazon web servers every day. And 1% of internet traffic in North America flows through Amazon web service, services. We're very proud of these statistics, and I'm David Brown. Um, I'm a member of the Amazon EC2 team. Um, I had the privilege of joining Amazon EC2 in 2007, about six months uh, after EC2 had gone live. Uh, back then, it was obviously a lot smaller. Um, we were, you know, believed we were building something big, but it was very interesting to see how it would, how it would develop over time. Um, and for the last five years, I've, I've been involved in the Cape Town office. Um, so that is Cape Town, the southern tip of Africa, and in South Africa. And very few people know, although it has been published, this is actually the home of Amazon EC2. So in 2004, the development center was set up there, and we developed Amazon EC2 out of Cape Town. In about 2008, we obviously moved to teams in Seattle, and now you have teams located at different geographical regions around the world, all supporting Amazon EC2. But Cape Town still remains a critical part of the team. Um, so four months ago, I had the privilege of moving to Seattle uh, with my family. And, uh, they told me the weather was going to be rainy all the time, and we had one of the best summers I've ever lived through. So apparently that never normally happens. So um, the rainy weather hasn't been too bad. Um, so unfortunately, I can't speak about what I'm doing now. It's still in the EC2 space. As you know, there are lots and lots of new services being developed all the time. Um, and I'm, I've got the privilege of working in one of those. So let's get into our plan for today. Um, I'm covering some basics, um, and I'll recommend some other talks you may want to go to to get some more information about certain areas. But the first thing is launching your own instance. So we'll go through that workflow. We'll follow that with understanding some of the storage fundamentals of EC2, so what is available. Very important you understand that. Uh, looking at some of the networking. Then we're going to talk a little bit about some of the newer features. In the last two years or so, we've added quite a lot of visibility into the health of your instances. And we're going to talk through some of those. And then finally end off with some documentation, where to go and you know, what to do next and where to find support. So if you, if you need help, how to get a hold of dev support. All of my presentations today, given that it's a 100 course, I'm going to be using the AWS Management Console. Um, so hopefully many of you have seen this. This is the standard login screen for the Management Console. And you can see EC2 listed there, second service. And this is the EC2 uh, sort of dashboard. So this is what you would see when you log in. And you can see I've currently, so this is in the Oregon region, I've currently got one instance running. So let's move on to launching your first instance. Before we do that, we should probably understand what an instance is. So an instance is really nothing more than a virtual server running inside an Amazon EC2 data center. So we're giving you access to a physical machine that you can access remotely. Uh, in the case of Linux, that's going to be an SSH connection. In the case of Windows, it's going to be an RDP connection. You, know, you could be using uh, port 80 for a website. You have a remote access to that machine. Uh, you also have complete control. I think that's been one of the fundamental uh, sort of decisions we've, we've taken with EC2 and with AWS is giving you a machine that you have complete control over. It's not that we control the machine and run your software. We actually give you a machine that you have root access to. Or in the case of Windows, you have an administrator login. It runs until it's stopped or terminated. So you choose the lifetime of that instance. You choose when you want to launch it, when you want to launch another one, and you choose when you want to terminate it or stop it. Um, the difference between stop and terminate, when you stop an EC2 instance, it's still available to be relaunched at a later date. When you terminate an EC2 instance, you're never going to see it again. Um, so it's important to understand the difference there. And finally, I'm going to include little bits about the metering side of things uh, for EC2 and the billing. We will incur, when you run an instance, as long as it's in the running state, you will incur an hourly charge for that instance, depending on the instance type that you've chosen. So be careful. If you're going to go and run through the Getting Started Guide, don't leave the instance running for the month. Uh, even if you're not actually using it, you are going to be charged hourly as long as it's running. Next, we're going to move on to understanding regions and availability zones. So this is sort of where it all starts. Uh, Amazon runs multiple regions around the world. Uh, you heard Andy say in the talk this morning we currently have nine, and we'll go through them shortly. Each region is completely isolated and separate from every other region. 
We did a lot of talk. When we, when we launched our first region after, we had a US region, then we launched Dublin. And we, a lot of discussion and design went into how should we support EC2 at a global level? Should we have one EC2, global EC2? Should we have EC2s in different geographical regions? And we believe it's a fundamental design decision and the right thing for us to have done to keep them completely separate. So the reason for that is obviously they, felt, you know, they, they, they fail completely independently. There's no chance that one region could impact another region. They are separate. We try and make sure that they're isolated in every way. You do have full connectivity between regions over the internet. So if you have an instance in uh, the US East one region, you could talk to an, an instance in any other region uh, by using its public IP address, and that would just be traffic over the internet. So it's important that when you, when you build your software, think about the region, and you launch your instance, think about the region that you want to choose. The console will default to a region that's closest to you geographically. That's relatively new. Make sure that the default that the console chooses is the region that's correct for you. And that might be latency to you, latency to your customers. It could even be legal requirements. For example, you may not be able to take certain data outside of the boundaries of the country. And it could also be the community. So you know, what images are available, and I'll talk about images shortly, but what, what other services has the community provided in the region that you're going to? So your region choice is very important. Once you've chosen your region, you pretty much are you know, bound to that region for some period of time. Um, these are the regions around the world. So as you can see, we have nine. Uh, I think it was about a week or two ago we launched Sydney, so we're very excited about that. Um, and we also have the GovCloud region, which is the ITAR compatible region. You can see in the top left-hand corner of that screen, I've got the region drop-down. So that is, sorry, top right-hand corner of that screen. Uh, that is the, uh, how you select your region in the console. As I said, will default, make sure that the default's correct for you. Sorry, I'll show what happened there. So within each region, so we've got these separate regions. Within each one of these regions, you're going to have multiple what we call availability zones. And the easiest way to describe them is they basically are separate data centers. Um, so in the sort of standard non-cloud or non-Amazon case, it would be several data centers on separate power grids, geographically far enough apart that the same disaster wouldn't hit two of them. And that's how we see an availability zone. We literally say that no issue will impact more than one availability zone at the same time for the same reason. Um, so we, we make sure that they're separate. Uh, so each zone is, is insulated from failures in any other zone. Um, and we recommend that you use multiple zones to protect against failure in a single location. I'm not going to go into too much detail on how to do that from an architectural point of view in this talk, but there are lots of other talks, and I'll recommend one later that tells you how to use availability zones, uh, running instances in multiple zones with load balancers, auto scaling, uh, all of those services. And this is, you know, this is something that Amazon's been doing for a long time, a long time before EC2, uh, or before we had the cloud. This is how we run the retail business. We're always running multiple data centers. Um, we want the loss of a data center to be a non-event, um, something you can sleep through, and that the other data centers, you're, you know, if you're in three data centers, the other two can take the load. Um, so if you, do, if you don't specify a zone, you can launch an instance without choosing a zone. EC2 will choose a zone for you, uh, and we have a whole rule set. That may be where you have purchased reserved instances. That may be where we have capacity available. Um, we've got an internal rule set. So if you don't specify a zone, we'll choose one. Um, if you do specify a zone, obviously select a zone. Uh, the zones are randomized by account, so you'll see things like US East 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D. Uh, just important to know that your, your zones are potentially not the same as my account zones. And we do that for a load balancing uh, reason, right? Everybody tends to choose 1A and 1B. Nobody chooses 1C and 1D. <laughs> so if everybody chooses 1A and 1B and they weren't randomized, we'd have two data centers with uh, C and D with nobody in them. So we randomize them for account. So that can catch you out at times when you're trying to talk to one of your friends and you're both in the same zone, but you can't see the traffic local, locally. So the availability zones, so the orange squares there indicate uh, the zones in each region. Um, you may not be able to see five zones, for example, in the US East 1 region. Um, so your account, if you're one of the very early EC2 accounts, you may see all five. Um, but we expose at least three zones in every region that has three zones, or at least two zones where they have two zones uh, to every account. So you may not see all the zones. It's obviously a whole lot of load balancing and management behind the scenes. Sorry, this clicker is not always clicking. Um, so now we're looking at Amazon machine images. This is really where it, where it starts um, for EC2. So the idea of having some sort of um, template um, that for the instance you're going to be launching. So it might be a, a version of Ubuntu. It might be an Amazon Linux uh, image. It might be a Windows image. But it's really where, what's your starting point. Uh, the image contains the root file system and all the data that's needed to boot the instance. Um, and you can obviously you know, bundle your own images. There, I took a quick count about a week ago. There's currently 15,000 public images 
um, available globally. Um, so these are individuals, these are both our partners. Um, these are you know, Amazon provided images. These are also, you know, any one of you, for example, could go and build a software stack um, and publish your own image and make that public. Uh, and then anybody else could come along and find that. Um, we also have support for multiple operating systems. I'll list a few shortly. Uh, and then images can be private shared between accounts or public. So once you've taken one of these images, you can actually you know, rebundle that image uh, and have that image privately on your account so your image can sort of have, you know, you can, you can bundle images every now and then and take snapshots. Um, you can also share between other accounts. So if you have a test account and a product account in your organization, you could share images like that. Um, and images can obviously also, if you have an image you want to make public and allow other people to use, um, you can do that. Sorry, this click has definitely got a problem. Um, some of the, some of the uh, pro software uh, partners we've partnered with, so Ubuntu, with my South African accent, I can say that, Ubuntu. Uh, Amazon Web Services, obviously we provide our own Linux images. Uh, obviously Microsoft, we provide the Windows images. Um, we work with uh, Suzy to provide those, Red Hat and Fedora. This is just, this is just six that I chose. Uh, if you look in the console, you, you will see them. Uh, on the uh, images tab, so this is the console view, and what I've done, if you look at the uh, table of contents on the, on the left, um, you can see I've selected the AMIs. Uh, actually, internally to Amazon, we call them AMIs, not AMIs. So uh, we've selected the AMIs tab, and you have filtered by Amazon provided images. Um, but there's a good place. So you, you want to go and find an image. Once you've got your image, that's the first thing you need to launch an instance. The second thing we're going to move on to is security. So you really need two pieces uh, of information from a security point of view before you launch your instance for the first time. So the first one is what we call a key pair. Um, for those that know Linux, may be very familiar with key pairs. It's something that Linux has used for a long time with SSH. Um, on the Windows um, side of things, it is a little bit more confusing. Windows obviously doesn't really have the notion of a key pair. Um, we do require it for both Windows and Linux. And the, the reason is public images don't have login information. It would be very, very bad if somebody that provided a public image left some credentials in that image that allowed anybody to log into them or even themselves to log into them. So public images are, are scrubbed and make sure that there's no login information that's got to be injected at boot time. And the way we do that is you create a key pair, and it's really a pair of keys. You've got a private key and a public key. Um, you can create your own by, in the console, I'll show you how to create a key pair. Um, you can also import a key pair. So if you know how to use SSH keygen, you, want it, or you may have a key that you're particularly fond of, you could actually import that key into EC2. Um, private keys remain private. They're called private for a reason. They're a secret. So you should never hand them out. You leave them in a folder on your directory that you make sure only you can have read access to, and you use you know, SSH, for example, to securely transmit that to Amazon. The public key will be, uh, that's, that's public information, it's fine. Uh, that'll actually be stored inside EC2, inside the instance. Um, and when you, when you log into the instance, we'll use normal SSH authentication and allow you to log in. So to create a key pair, that's looking at the key pair screen. If you don't have any key pairs, uh, click the Create Key Pair button. The dialog pops up. I've chosen to call my key pair web server. I can name, I can have as many uh, key pairs as I like. I think the limit is 5,000. Um, and I can name them uh, whatever I like. And quite literally, in this case, EC2 has generated a key pair for me. It would actually allow me to download the private portion of that key which I should store, and it's giving me a fingerprint as well. So I've got my key pair, which is at my login credentials, basically. The next thing is the security groups. So if you launch an instance on EC2, and I actually still do this fairly often, I catch myself out every time we launch a new region, I launch an instance and I can't log into it. And I think, oh, what, what's going on here? Why can't I log into my instance? And I'm like, I haven't set up my security group. So your security group is literally your firewall for EC2. Um, every single account comes with a default security group. Your default security group has absolutely zero ports open. So that's why launching your first instance, you wouldn't be able to log into it. Nothing's open. I need to go and open port 22 for SSH. I need to go open port 80. Um, so literally, it's quite literally a firewall. You can modify uh, you know, the ports and source ciders uh, and decide what inbound traffic you, sh you would like. A um, lot of information in, this, in our documentation around what you shouldn't do. So for example, be careful about your source cider. Don't open it up. Cider is your subnet, so don't open it up to 0.0.0.0 slash .0, .0, 0 and give anybody access. Try and limit that to a set of IP address addresses or a CIDR range that is, that is more limiting. Obviously, with port 80, if you want the world to see your website, you should do that. So you know, think, think about how you open up your CIDRs. So sorry, creating the security group. So if you look in the console, you do have a default one by default. Um, you can obviously create others. Um, but at the bottom, I've gone there. And you can see in the bottom right-hand corner that I've set up uh, two uh, ciders. I basically said port 80 for all traffic and port 22 for a cider range that's somewhat near my 
uh, home ADSL uh, IP. Moving on to instance types. So we've got key pairs, we've got security groups, we've chosen a region, uh, we've chosen image. Uh, one of the last things we need to do is look at instance types. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but basically instance type determines the underlying hardware of your instance. So if you want to use Amazon's free tier, you can run what we call a T1 micro instance. They all have names like T1 micro, M1 small, M1 large, uh, CC1, 4X large, 8X large. Um, those are the sorts of naming conventions we use. Um, so instance types will determine that. So it's literally the amount of memory that you're going to get, the amount of CPU you're going to get. Uh, it also impacts the amount of, of disk space that you're going to get and, and could also impact some of the instance types, for example, give you access to a general purpose GPU. And you can have a look. Each, each instance type has a different cost. You can change instance types after you launch an instance in some cases, and that obviously allows for, for vertical scaling. You can't do it while the instance is running, so you will need to stop the instance, change your instance type, and relaunch. So there's a talk tomorrow at uh, 10.30 by Deepak Singh. Uh, so Deepak's a product manager with EC2, sitting in the front row over there. And D Deepak's going to take you through instance types and what we, what we think about when we design instance types and what you should be thinking about when you choose your instance types. So I'd recommend that you attend that if you want more information. So to recap, we chose a region. I chose Oregon. We chose an image. I chose the Amazon Linux image. I created a key pair. I set up my security group. I'm ready to launch. And to launch, go to the console, click the Launch Instance button. You get an option of three wizards. I've chosen one of the more complicated ones just to show you the process. Uh, you can choose any one of those. It's going to ask you to select your image. So I know I want the Amazon image, which is the top one on the list. I click the Select button. It takes me through to select my instance types. There you can see the instance type drop down. The instance types are sometimes filtered by the type of image that you chose. So if you, some instance types, some images are not supported on all instance types, so that list may or may not look quite like that. But that's a fairly common, common list. You can see T1 micro uh, and all the other instance types. Once I'm happy with that, I click continue. On this screen, as you get more into EC2, you can change a lot of these things, uh, but we're going to ignore most of that for now. I can set up my ephemeral drives or my instance stores, which will, these, these are basically my disks that are available to me locally on the machine. I can, I can tag my instance. So you've heard a lot about tagging at, at the conference, and this is literally the name tag. So it's a tag we say you should probably have so you know what your instance is. And we, you know, for many years, we forced our customers to remember instance IDs. Some people were very good at that, but names are obviously a lot easier. Uh, and I select my key pair. I select my security group, and final, well, this clicker is, sorry. And final summary, I just want to do a quick check. Once I click that launch button, I am going to start paying for that instance as soon as it's the running state. So you should just make one last check that you're happy with what you're going to get. Is there another button I can use for this clicker? No, it's, it's okay, I'll keep battling, it's fine. Okay, and I close it. So you can see what I've got over there is I've got my instance on that first line, and you can see that one of the columns says state, and it says running, where the green dot is. Uh, when, just after that instance launch, it'll be in the pending state. And you're normally going to wait around anything from two to five minutes for a Linux instance. For a Windows instance, it's slightly longer uh, for that instance to reach, reach the running state. Once it's reached the running state, it means that you can connect to that instance. It should have, you know, from a Linux point of view, it should have its, it should be ready, it should have the prompt ready for you to log in. Um, on a Windows point of view, sometimes you need to wait a little longer for the password to be generated. We do generate an administrator password for every instance that's launched, um, and then you would need to retrieve the password, and that can take a little longer um, from time to time. So obviously I want to connect to the instance, so by right-clicking the instance, I can bring up the context menu, and I can click connect. And that brings up this screen. Uh, it provides me with two pieces of information. Uh, this is a Linux instance, so it's telling me, uh, if you look there where it says example, uh, SSH, uh, I've actually got the SSH command prompt that I can plug into my shell terminal and connect to the instance. It's got my key pair name in there, so it assumes that I saved my private key pair locally to that command. And it's got my instance pub public IP address and the username, which is easy to use in this case. The console also supports for Linux instances, does also support a login from within the console. Uh, so you, you can actually do that now. Uh, I haven't done that in this case, but if I click the section right at the bottom, just above the close button, I could actually get an SSH terminal running inside my browser. So once I do that, you can see I've got my SSH terminal with a little bit of ASCII art that we've had since V1 of EC2, and it says welcome to EC2, and tells you about, about the instance that you've launched. Uh, and as you can see, I'm logged in as EC2 user. I can sudo to root if I want to be root. 
uh, and I literally have a machine that is as if I had the box on my desk. You know, it's, it no, is no way managed or controlled by Amazon. It's just your machine. We control all the infrastructure underneath that machine. Great, so just to recap, we, we spoke about what an instance is, so hopefully there's no more confusion around that. Regions and availability zones, we looked at selecting your image. Spoke about security. Uh, the security one, you, you really only need to do the first time. It's not something you have to do every time you launch an instance. It's just to uh, make sure you've got a key pair and you've got a security group. Once you've done that, unless you want different ones, you don't need to change them. We spoke about instance types. Um, I recommended Deepak's talk, and we, we launched an instance. The next thing I want to talk about is storage. So there are really two types of storage, and I'm not going to be looking at RDS or DynamoDB or S3 or any of the other AWS services that are also in the storage space, really just storage that EC2 provides. Two types of storage, one we call the local instance store. You may also see it referred to as ephemeral stores in some of our documentation and within EC2 and on the forums. And then we obviously have the Amazon Elastic Block Store. When we launched EBS, I can remember everybody being very confused as to why Amazon launched the Amazon Elastic Bookstore. And then they, then they realized that it was actually the block store. So this is not the Elastic Bookstore as everybody thought on launch. We hadn't thought about that at all when we named it. It was quite amusing. Um, so Instance Store. This is what we had in 2006 when EC2 went live. Um, any of you who remember that? Anybody launched an in instance? I'd be very surprised if you come into the 100 course on EC2 and you launched the instance in 2006. But in 2006, the bar for using EC2 was a lot higher. Um, it, basically, you had a temporary block level storage on your instance, and you weren't able to stop your instance. So once you launched your instance, if you shut it down, it was gone forever. And any data that you may have generated on that instance was gone forever. So you'd have to back that up to S3, and it really required a much higher bar and much more skill developed to actually use it. And we innovated over the years, and we launched EBS in, in 2000 and 2008. Um, but, so this is temporary block level storage. It's literally physically attached to the physical machine that your instance is running on. So you can think of this as the disk drives that are kind of under your instance. Um, not as in uppercase letters. Please understand this is not persisted after your instance is either stopped or terminated. So if you shut your instance down, that data on those drives is not going to be available to you ever again. Um, and the, the reason you so this, the cost of this is included in the hourly charge of your instance. So when you run an instance and you pay let's say 10 cents an hour, you're not going to pay anything more for the storage. Uh, and we recommend that you use this for mutating data uh, that you don't need to store uh, for long term, you don't need from a long-term persistence point of view. And I'm sure a lot of you are thinking, well, what data is that? Um, and, you know, we have a lot of customers that run sort of persistent caches, and they're quite happy to lose that data. They just want to make sure it's persisted while it's running, but they can lose and recover from a failure. It's cheap storage. Um, we've also launched recently the SSD instance type, which gives you local SSD storage, and there are a lot of applications that, that can effectively make use of that, but don't need the long-term uh, persistence. It's also a great scratch disk. Um, so one thing to note is those stores may not be visible to you when you launch an instance. So we did see the screen while we were launching the instance. You actually do need to go and conf configure those stores. By default, um, they are not mounted, so they're not mapped into your instance. So you do need to go and configure those stores, and then they'll be available at a mount point, and you can actually use them. So remember, it's not persistent. So then we get the Elastic Block Store, EBS. So this is your persistent block level storage, and it's not obviously attached as a disk on, the, on, each, insta, on each physical machine. Uh, it's actually attached via the network, and while the other storage is really determined, the size is determined by the instance type, you can define the size on your EBS volume. So you can create a volume up to one terabyte. You can obviously create smaller volumes. You can create multiple volumes. You, know, you really have a say on what you need. Um, the cost is not included in the instance hours. So you, you will pay an additional EB, EBS charge for volume usage. So it's important that you understand that and how much you're going to pay. So it does add a little bit to your instance cost. Uh, and this should be used for mutating data. Uh, that needs to uh, long-term persistence. The reason I say mutating data there is if your data doesn't need to mutate very often, uh, then you can obviously consider something like uh, Amazon S3, you know, where you're just storing data. You're not going to be doing writes to it. You don't need random I.O. access. Um, so that's, that's your long-term persistence. So what I want to walk you through here is just creating the volume uh, in, in EBS. Um, so what I've got open here is I've got my volumes page open. You may be wondering where that volume came from. Well, that is actually the first volume from the instance I launched. So if you launch what we call an EBS-backed instance, there will be an associated volume created for you, and you'll see a volume there. So you're going to see a combination here of volumes you created and volumes that uh, Amazon created when you launched those instances. So by clicking the Create Volume button on the top left there, uh, I can enter my size. I've chosen a size of 100 gigabytes. You will pay per gig, um, so think about that. 
And literally, I clicked OK, and it created the volume for me. I do need to select the availability zone. Um, so your volumes can only be attached to instances in the same availability zone as the instance. So if you didn't specify an availability zone when you launched that instance, in this case, it's in uh, US West 2C, uh, in my case. So make sure that you look where your instance is before you go and create your volume. So create the volume in the same zone. What you're going to do is create a volume, and you're going to try and attach it, and it's not going to show your instance, and you're going to wonder why. So make sure that in the same zone. So I want to attach this to my instance. I can simply right-click, select Attach in the context menu. Uh, and what it'll show me here is because it knows the volumes in Availability Zone C, it'll show me all instances that are in Availability Zone C. And that, uh, that little drop-down box, I can select the instance. It's also going to give me the mount point, so where, or the device name, so where in Linux do you want this exposed? How do you want this exposed? If you don't understand that, that's absolutely fine. Um, if you're running Linux, you probably have to have a limited understanding, but you can let EC2 choose that for you. If you're trying to do something a little bit more advanced, you can actually change that device name. Uh, the device name is the slash dev uh, SDF. And once I've done that, you can see that you may not have noticed, but the state has now gone to in use. It was originally available, and now it's in use. So I put this in the slide because the decks will be available for download, and you may need this. Um, there was really no way I could simplify this. This is once you've attached that volume to your Linux instance, uh, you, you obviously need to make sure that it's writable. So you've got to create a file system on it. It's, a, it's not a file system. It's a block device. It's quite literally like a disk drive that you may have bought that hasn't been formatted. So we need to format it. And that first command there is really just sort of making the file system uh, on that block device at that same mount point. And then I create the, the mount point. I create the directory. And then I call mount to mount the the file system. And I did a little DF there command just to see. And you can see the very last line in that slide shows that I've got a volume that has 99 gigabytes available to me. So obviously, the creating the file system used up a little bit of the space. So that's attached to an EBS volume. EBS volumes are really, uh, there's some redundancy in EBS in that we, you know, we have multiple copies of those drives. Um, but if it's, it's, it's really as durable as a disk drive. Uh, it's not S3, which has 11 nines availability or durability. It's, it's a disk drive. So what you want to be doing with EBS is you do want to be taking snapshots at regular intervals. An EBS snapshot is a point in time backup of your volume. So you essentially call an API, tell EC2, please take the contents of that volume and back that up to S3. And that, that, con that data stored in S3 is obviously the 11, nine, 11 nines durable. It's stored in S3. It's available. And you can go and create volumes from that snapshot at a future point in time. So in the case of RDS, for example, um, they take snapshots once a day for their customers and store that in S3 um, so that they can recover if, they've ever, if they ever lose a volume. Uh, and we recommend the same thing if you're using EBS. OK, quickly create snapshot. I can click on my volume, go to the context menu. I could give it a name and a description, and I actually did. I, I screenshotted too early. Um, I think the description is optional. The name is required. And there you can see I've got a snapshot, and, and the name was just uh, snapshot and then today's date. And I could right click on that and create a volume if, if I wanted to. So, just the storage recap um, I've drawn a little image to sort of try and explain the different types of storage. So, obviously, we've got a host machine there. A uh, little bit of inside information we actually call our host machines an EC2 droplets because uh, many droplets make up a cloud. So, that's our host machine. On that host machine, we have instance stores. And we spoke about those instance stores being ephemeral in that that data will go away if that machine's shut down. And then if we move one over to the middle, you've got Amazon EBS. It's obviously off instance storage, using it via the network. Uh, persistent storage, that storage, the data will live after the instance has been termina terminated. And the uh, Amazon S3, obviously, is where the snapshots are saved. Just one last little piece of information. With the instance store, if you reboot your instance, you won't lose that data. So it's quite safe to actually write to your instance store and then tell ET2 to reboot the instance. You, you'll still have your data available to you. It's only when you stop and terminate. So reboots are, are not affected. Okay. So let's look at some of the networking uh, side of things and very, very high level uh, introduction to some of the networking. So EC2, we're talking about EC2, you know, not, not the Amazon VPC side of EC2, but EC2 is really just one big flat network in every region. It's a very large CIDR, and we, we assign private IP addresses. And every instance in a region can communicate with every other instance in a region. Uh, if you're local in availability zone, you can communicate on your private IPs. If you go between availability zones, you do what we call regional traffic, and you will be billed, uh, I think it's one cents per gig for that traffic. Um, 
And traffic between regions, as I said earlier, is transferred over the internet. So one big flat network is sort of the standard EC2 network if you're not using VPC. Uh, each instance gets both a private and public IP address. Um, so when you launch your instance, as soon as it goes to running, you'll see a private and public IP. Public IP is what you should use outside the cloud. It's obviously addressable over the internet. Private IP is only addressable within EC2. If you're talking between EC2 instances and you use the private IP and they're in the same zone, you won't be charged for that traffic. If you use the private IP and you go between zones, you will be charged for that traffic. So that, that you should think about where you put your instances. The charge is small, so don't put all your instances in one zone, because then when that zone goes down, when that's an issue, you may, you may lose your instances. So you know, have some uh, cross-zone redundancy. And DNS names are provided for both private and public, so you can use a DNS name. Elastic IP addresses, so uh, in the early days of EC2, we didn't have static IPs. You got assigned an IP, and when your instance terminated, your public IP went away. You didn't own it. So people were using dynamic DNS and all sorts of things to try and run their web servers, and we gave, gave the world elastic IPs, which is literally static IPs. So you can call EC2 and say, give me a static IP, and you own that IP. It belongs to you. It's on your account. Nobody else can use it. And you can decide where to attach that elastic IP, what instance you want to attach it to. And we, did we don't charge you as long as that elastic IP is mapped to an instance. So this is really just to conserve IPs. They are a limited resource. So we don't want people to be hoarding you know, tens of IPs that they're not using. So we will charge you. It's a small charge. Uh, I can't remember what it is, but very, very small charge per IP per hour that's not mapped. So make sure you're using your IPs. And you can quite safely put those into a DNS somewhere. And when an instance fails, you can remap them elsewhere or just fail over, just change the IP. So give me an idea, that's my IP that I got from EC2. I'm talking to that server. That server goes down or has some sort of issue. I just call EC2 and tell it to remap. And within a few seconds, uh, that traffic will now be redirected to a new instance. So allocating an IP address, I go to the IP address tab and I click allocate a new address. Complete the little form and that's the IP that Amazon gave, gave to me. And I now own that IP. To associate it, right click. I can select the instance, and this can be any, this is, this is in the region, so it's not an availability zone. IPs are, elastic IPs are regional constructs, so I can attach to any instance in any availability zone. So I can select an instance from the drop down, and you can see the public DNS name is now the same as my IP address. So I've remapped it. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but you've probably heard a lot of talk around Amazon VPC or Amazon Virtual, Virtual Private Cloud at this conference. It is the direction that we're taking EC2 networking. Uh, and really, this is sort of giving you the ability to create your own network within EC2. So you may want to use a 10 dot CIDR range, or you may want to have an area of the network that's connected to your on-premise network through VPN. You can do all of this with Amazon VPC. And the way we've designed it is a lot of the constructs that you're familiar with, maybe within your data center, subnets, routers, um, you, can, you can do those exact same constructs within Amazon EC2 and have a network that's set up and very similar to what you're familiar with. And uh, you, important point, a lot of people, initially when we launched VPC, the only way to get access to your VPC was through a VPN. So you needed to have a VPN tunnel, which required you know, a lot of networking gear on site. Um, we've changed that over the years so that you can actually now run a VPC and have an internet gateway available. You no longer need a VPN to run a VPC. You can have an internet gateway for connectivity and still have a network that's in a 10 dot range or you know, whatever, whatever side of range you choose. There's really no limitation there. So if you want to know more about the uh, VPC, I recommend you attend Eric Schultz's talk. So Eric Schultz is a product manager within EC2 that works on Amazon VPC. This could be a great talk for really understanding how you can utilize VPC within your organization and all the different you know, business models that customers are doing, both within the cloud and connecting back to uh, on-premise. So that basic networking, simple recap. And then I wanted to give you, a, so we've launched an instance, we've looked at some of the storage options, we looked at some of the networking fundamentals, and, and I wanted to end off, it was difficult to choose the last section, but I think monitoring is an important area to understand what's available there as well, because if you've got this instance, you don't want your customers to tell you when it's down. Right, something we get very embarrassed about at Amazon is when a customer tells us there's a problem and we didn't know before them. And we want to give you the tools to be able to do that for your customers as well. So we're going to look at instance status metrics, which was launched about a year and a half ago. Look at instance performance metrics, which is powered by CloudWatch, and then some of the CloudWatch alarms as well. So what EC2 now does is every couple of minutes, every minute in some cases, every five minutes in other cases, we actually run a whole lot of automated little tests against your instance and against the underlying infrastructure. So for every instance running in the cloud, we know whether it's currently healthy. 
And we split that health into two areas. The one is the system health, which we call system impairment, and the other one is instance health, which we call instance impairments. So system health gives us an indication as to whether everything that Amazon, everything that we needed to do to make sure that that instance is healthy, that we've done and it's working. So that's all the software that goes into running an EC2 instance, is that working? You know, does that machine that you're on actually have power? Is there a net, can I actually you know, get to that machine from a networking point of view? We, we, we make sure that that's the system health. That's Amazon's responsibility. And then we have instance health, which is the area we can't do much about. That's within your instance. So you may have actually logged in and, and shut down your F0, you know, IF down F0, and we obviously, your instance is impaired, but it's something that you've done. So Amazon can't really do much to help you there. It's inside your instance. You should try a reboot. Um, you know, or something to, to try and diagnose the problem. It could also be that your application is Umin and doesn't even have enough resources to respond to a networking request. Uh, Umin is out of memory. Um, so you know, it may, something may be wrong within your instance. So we split that and we represent that to you. So if you look in the console, uh, and what I've done here is clicked on my instance tab, and you can take a look at the bottom there. Uh, I've got the two status checks. The one on the left says system status checks, and the one on the right says instance status checks. And uh, thank goodness for the demo, but these two instances are actually healthy, or well, this one instance. So I can see my system is healthy and my uh, instance status checks are healthy. So what I did is I logged into the instance and I actually ran IF down, or F, F down, uh, IF down, F zero. And you can see what happened. Within a, a minute or so, EC2 came up and said, whoop, your instance status check is now failing. And uh, you can see if you, in, in, at the top you can see it says one of two checks, so it says, Everything Amazon needed to do for this instance looks to be healthy, but it looks like there's a problem inside the instance. So um, I resolved this problem by just calling reboot from the console, and the instance rebooted, Linux came up and turned on my F0 again, and I had access to my machine. So that's instance status checks, very, very useful, and you, sh you should be relying on them. There's obviously API access, so you can build uh, monitoring tools around it. The next one is instance metrics, um, and this has been around for some time. Uh, we have two different types of instance metrics. This is quite literally raw metrics, so it's things like CPU, you know, all the stuff you're probably used to on a Windows machine or Linux machine, your disk I.O., uh, read length, queue length, all those sorts of things, uh, disk writes, network bytes, uh, all those sort of health metrics uh, are available to you. We provide them free of charge at five minutes, five minute granularity, and if you do want to see minutely granularity, uh, you can enable that and you, you pay an hourly fee for that. And if you look in the management console, so what I've done is just same screen, I've just gone from the status checks tab to the monitoring tab, and you can see there uh, I was running a while true loop uh, on that instance, and it was a T1 micro, so while true did something bad to the CPU, so it's 100% uh, CPU usage. So it's one thing having metrics, we all like metrics, at Amazon we love metrics, everything is very data driven and very metric focused, but we obviously need alarms around those metrics. We wanna make sure that we don't have to be watching them 24 seven. And this is what CloudWatch Watch Alarms gives you. Um, so any metric that we expose, both instance metrics uh, as well as the uh, instance status metrics, you can actually configure alarm around uh, and do that quite simply through the CloudWatch console. We also support threshold based alarms. So you can have some threshold uh, that you can say, you know, if my alarm goes above a certain threshold alarm, but you obviously get noisy metrics. You get some metrics that shoot up for a CPU, for example, might spike to, let's say you get an alarm at 60%, it may spike to, spike to 65% for one interval and then be absolutely fine again. And you may, may not want to wake up uh, if that's the case. So we actually allow you to say, give us a threshold and tell us how many data points above that threshold um, you want to uh, have before you actually trip the alarm. So in this case, I configured some threshold and said three data points. So you can see a trip to threshold at three data points, but not at the one data point threshold. The availability side of things, I just wanted to recommend this talk by Attila Naren. So Attila was in Cape Town originally as well, part of the early EC2 team. Uh, he's now a, a solutions architect, uh, and I think that's gonna be a really good talk tomorrow at 11.35 uh, on architecting for high availability. Why don't you recap, as I said, we looked at the metrics. And then finally, I wanted to leave you with just some documentation and support. So where to go next? Um, so I hope this has been useful.